Hello, my name is Jean O'Brien and I was delighted to be asked to give a reading in this year's Trim Poetry Festival, a wonderful festival um, run by a great team down here, Michael Farry, Orla Fay and various other people and thank you very much. There is a gale force wind blowing outside so if you hear any sort of muffled noises that's what it is. Uh, I'm sorry about that, I don't control the weather. But uh, I also want to say that I'm going to read 10 poems. So if you want to go off and get cups of tea or whatever, at least you know how long you're in for, so to speak. The main poems I will be reading is from my last collection, my new and selected Fish on a Bicycle. I have a new collection coming out, Stars Burn Regardless, in September from Salmon Poetry. Got that ad in there now. So one of the poems I'll read from my new collection. I was lucky enough to have this published in the Irish Times there earlier in the year. And it's obviously a Covid poem that we're all writing. What else are we writing about? But it has a note of hope to it. And it's also dealing with climate change. And it's called Still Here. When all this is over and we have obeyed the freshness of water the susurrations of air. We will still know death's piercing scent. It is the sweet smell of tarragon mixed with the pungency of lemon thyme. We must not forget that the forests hold our breath, every leaf a green promise, every bud a gift. We will circle the wagons, treasure the warmth of our fire. Lambent flames reflecting their glow in our eyes. We must hold on with the stalking fox, the prowling wolf, the swimming fish, the birds wheeling in the air and us holding on, all here, all still here. The next poem I want to read is on a lighter note. It's called Moonstruck Generation and it was dedicated to Neil Armstrong who, as you know, was the first person to walk on the moon back in 1969, was it? Uh, And some of you are far too young to remember that but to those of us of that generation it was the most exciting, exciting thing to have ever happened and we all spent all day long looking up at the moon and trying to imagine this. I think the whole thing took about seven days. Born after the unhinging of war and before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Those weeks when we counted not in days and hours, but minutes and brushed so close to disaster. Ever after we looked to the sky at night for the face of the yellow moon, watching over us like a hovering older sister, paler than day's bright sun. The dark sky, pinpricked with starlight, drew us to it. We knew little of computers, but knew our silvery, steadfast moon, her coming and going, the way she rolled the sky from dusk to dawn, from crest to horizon. How sometimes in early morning both planets could be seen at once. We were going there. Excitement orbited the days and hours to countdown. All watched agog the precise preparations. Saw that amazing spaceship and felt we knew the earthlings who flew in it. They blasted off, exited Earth's atmosphere. Left us bereft for days. With crammed necks we tracked their progress. Let loose from our world, they bivouacked on the sea of tranquillity. Grounded, children flew cereal box cutouts, practised hopping as if released from gravity, though always staying on the frequency of home. In that eight-day week, we could have sworn Apollo 11 appeared like a clear vision, coursing steadily for its feisty prize, but logged only a tumult of stars. Collectively, we released our breath 
when they splashed back from the blue into the Pacific and appeared to walk on water. The next poem I want to read is a little more serious, I'm afraid. It's a poem about my mother and um, my mother suffered from mental illness and unfortunately killed herself the summer I turned 15 and I found a beautiful photograph of her, I was given it, of her swinging on a chestnut tree when she was a young woman of 17 before all these things happened and I'll just read the poem. This is a girl of 17, a side view, seated on a swing, hung from a chestnut tree, her dress hitched by the wind. This is a picture of my mother before I was her daughter, before her father disowned her, before she married my father, before she had six children. This was all before the swinging 60s that could not free her, before the doctors, before the hospital stays grew longer and longer, before they fed the electricity into her poor head that failed to help her, before the priest offered prayer as a cure, before the shock of her own mother's death hit home. This is my mother before I saw her, dead in the bed, her cold hands clutching at air, before life swung full circle and could no longer hold her. This is her on that green day, skirt askew, hair streaming out, holding the ropes of the swing taut, rushing to meet her future, arcing in the air before her. This next one is also about my mother and it's about... um, sort of when you're young, the invincibility of mothers, or so you believe as a child, then you grow up and find they're all too human. But she had um, her varicose veins done and refused to go back to the doctor to get the stitches taken out and insisted on doing them herself. And I, as a child, was absolutely fascinated and horrified at the same time by this. And it's called Stitched. Your scissors flew ripping all in their path, inches and inches of stitches, tied off like butterflies, the ends going nowhere. Each one neatly ravelled as you pulled and sliced at it, the tapestry pattern that travelled your leg from ankle to groin was impressive to my young eye. The doctor was shocked as he tried to stop you, but you were vehement. They had done your veins, cut and snipped them, turned them inside out, a tailor's dummy. You said you wanted to reclaim the seams that carried the blood back to the heart. Again, I was going to say we'll go on a lighter note, but it's sort of a mixture of a lighter note and not because it has a bit of a serious intent. It's called domestic. My house is full of knives. Sharp blades wait to ambush me in drawers. I get sleepy from their cuts. My onion finger peels back layers, reveals the blood and guts of me. Sometimes the trap is on the stairs. A lost left shoe, discarded there, hides like a snare to trip me up. There's danger in domestic things such as you would never dream. Light falling at an awkward angle can splinter air like discordant voices. My head becomes the tumble dryer's cycle. Round and round it goes. That's to all us domestic goddesses out there. This next poem. I'm not actually mentioning the different books these poems are from because they're all under the one cover but they're obviously my previous four collections. So this one I want to read is from The Shadow Keeper which is an old book of mine. Um, Wait till I just find the page. Now I was lucky enough 
No, it's not called. The, it's the book is the Shadow Keeper. Sorry, but the poem is Census, and I was lucky enough to get this poem included. I think it was about two years ago in a project called the Poetry Jukebox, and it was outside the um, museum down there on the Keys, the Famine Museum. And we were asked to put in poems. It was called Hungering. And if you went along to the actual jukebox, you could press a button beside the poem you wanted to hear. So it was a great idea. But unfortunately, they had to move it around. I think it's in Paris at the moment. It would be lovely if it could have been a a permanent fixture there. Anyway, this is my poem. Census. It has an explanation. A census taken in 1837 in an area of Donegal with 9,000 inhabitants, found that they possessed in total 10 beds. So we were well, well hungry and in trouble long before any um, famine came along. Stones like steps on the road, heavy, hard and hungry. The hedges stripped of halls and berries. Fields once full of yellow dandelions, hung ears of corn and swaying wheat, all bare like my children, standing in their shifts, their petticoats bartered for corn bread. Before us the road goes nowhere, behind the cottage is tumbled, bedding itself down into the hard acres. I have no furniture to speak of, just one copper pot, given on marriage, by my mother, tied now with twine about my waist, echoing like a bell in empty space. Um, this next one is from my book Merman, when I find it now, and it turned out to be sort of a lucky poem for me and a very popular poem, and we've had great fun with it. Uh, it's called Skinny Dipping and it is based on a true incident uh, that happened to me when I was over in Texas a number of years ago with an artist that I met up in Anna McCarrick, the wonderful artist Dixie Friend Gay. If any of you want to look up her art, it's wonderful. And I'll read the poem. I'm Irish. We keep our clothes on most of the time. We perform contorted dances on beaches in Cork or Donegal, undressing under not-yet-wet towels, worried that any gap might expose us, lay some body part bare. It was the Immaculate Conception that did it. If Mary could conceive a child without removing her knickers, then by God the rest of us could undress and swim without bearing our buttocks. We swam serene in freezing seas, goosebumps freckling our pale skin. We lay togged out on wet sand, desperate for the weak sun to dry us, before performing the contorted dance in reverse. Now, as I remove my clothes, peel them off, layer by layer, down to the bare, A brief moment of unease before the release of water baptising skin. With a quiet Jesus Mary, I dive in. The next one I want to read is also from Merman and it's called The Blue Bobbin. And I think anyone, again, of a certain age will know what I'm on about. Most houses back in the day had a singer sewing machine and often remained with just the table or the winding bit, the treadle. And you often see them nowadays, as we know, in pubs. Pub? What's that? What's that? What's a pub, anyone? Pubs that we used to go to often use them as tables. It's dull case and ornament in the corner its use almost forgotten. Someone has taken the table of the Singer sewing machine. Once everyone had one. If you lifted it out, you could turn the handle instead of footing the treadle. Gone, along with the table, is the drawer that held bobbins. 
my delight as a child, sifting the spools of rainbow thread. When my mother sewed, she favoured the blue bobbin. All our curtains, whatever the colour, were backed with blue stitches. I helped her thread the needle through a maze of eyes and hooks, down to where the thread vanished into a small silver box. Like a magician pulling an endless stream of hankies from his sleeve, it conjured another thread, and together they and we formed the stitch. At night, when Mother was busy, I used to slide the lid on the silver chamber to see if I could figure out its trick. I only saw the small half-moon lever moving back and over like a hidden slice of sky, the edge of a blue bobbin peeping out. This next one is actually out of Merman itself. It didn't make it into the selected. It's, again, a, a light and serious poem about a medical procedure that some of you may have had to do with thyroid. And um, the thyroid, whether you know it or not, is a little butterfly-shaped thing that sits in your clavicle and it can turn against you, turn against you. And they sometimes nuke them down in a, in a place in the hospital called the Nuclear Medicine something. Anyway, I'll tell you, you go down there and they're all in lead aprons and all looking very serious and you think, oh my God, what have I let myself in for? It's fine though. But you're not allowed to hold children for a couple of days. You have to wear a red thing basically to say you're radioactive. Throttle. They wore lead aprons, held a small Pandora's chest aloft, like a miniature coffin. They opened it slowly Nothing flew out. Nestled in sponge, a needle the size of Cleopatra's and spiky as a splinter. A little prick and it's over, they suited. Cradled in my clavicle, the butterfly of my thyroid had turned. Needed to be burned, they nuked my neck. It felt naked, stricken. When they left, I heard white noise, a flutter of recoiling wings. And my last poem that I want to end on, again a very lucky poem for me, about the mother and baby homes, about that ongoing desperate scandal that seems to have sort of riveted Ireland and went on for far too long. And definitely we need to breathe fresh air into it and stop shoveling our secrets under carpets and stop treating our women the way we had been treating them. Now, I was lucky enough with this poem for it to be part a number of years ago of a postcard series that Poetry Ireland did called Truth or Dare. And it was also put up on the Dart train, which obviously I was very pleased about. Um... This poem was written as part of an anthology, sorry, called The Lee Green Down, which was a response from poets to poems by Patrick Kavna. A woman called Eileen Casey was the editor of it and fair play to Eileen and congratulations because it it was a marvellous thing. And mine was a response to a poem of Kavna's called To a Child. And I dedicated it for the lost children of Toome's mother and baby home. They went, those children, into dark places, not of the soul, but into the cold earth. And all the while, the lean wind stripped their bones. Down, down they went, in tens, in dozens, like puppets or shadow dolls. The ragged scrim that wrapped them, frayed in the hungry wind. The unforgiving sky is full of stars. The dome of dank earth is full of missing children. 
Hush, we know you are lost, child. We will find you. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed it. And congratulations to everyone else.